you can only affect your own performance. So I definitely want to make sure that my goals in the sport are, are for me. Like I want to be hitting my potential. And, you know, obviously I think that, that if I do that correctly, that I've got a great shot to, to win competitions, to, to be the best in the world. But being, being number one in the world or winning a competition is not something that's entirely within my control. So I don't want to make that the goal. I want to make the process the goal. Welcome to Champions Mojo, a podcast to bring out your inner champion. Your hosts are sisters-in-law, Kelly Palace and Maria Parker. Kelly is a former Division I head swim coach, Olympic trials qualifier, and holds national and world records in master swimming. Maria holds world records in endurance cycling and won the world's toughest bike race, Race Across America. Both are certified health and life coaches. Our goal is to inspire you through conversations with champions. And now your host, Kelly Palace. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Champions Mojo podcast. And as usual, I am co-hosting with Maria Parker. Hello, Maria. Good afternoon, Kelly. How are you? Oh, I'm doing great. And I am so thrilled to be welcoming Olympian Josh Pernod to our show today. Josh is an Olympic silver medalist and the current American record holder in the 200-meter breaststroke. He's also a graduate of California, Berkeley. Josh kept getting better in his college career, and that culminated in a gold medal at the NCAAs in the 400 IM in 2016. He followed that up with a win and an American record in the 200-meter breaststroke at the Olympic trials and a silver medal in the 200-meter breaststroke at the 2016 Rio Olympics. Maria, before we bring Josh in, will you tell us a little more about him? Sure, Kelly. Josh has been swimming since he and his mother did mom and me baby swim lessons. Josh is from Santa Maria, California and graduated from UCAL Berkeley with a physics degree. Josh is currently a professional swimmer sponsored by Adidas and in 2019 was named a member of the LA Current ISL team. Last year, Josh married his longtime girlfriend, Tiffany Sudharma in Indonesia in a wedding that was beautiful wedding that was photographed by People Magazine. We'll let Josh tell us the rest. Josh, welcome to Champions Mojo. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. So, Josh, let's uh, dive right in, so to speak. And I, just because it's the first thing that sticks out in your intro, for me, most of our athletes that at your level are sponsored by uh, another swimsuit maker. Tell us a little bit about being with Adidas. I just, I, I, I love to know what these uh, other makers are doing and am i even saying adidas right because we know some people say it differently so tell us a little bit about adidas um adidas is awesome they've been so so cool to work with they're a very data driven company to see them put all those resources into the sport of swimming is really cool they they do so much work with with body analysis just to make sure that everything's fitting properly and swimming racing suits are very very tight and you want to have like the, the correct amount of squeeze at, <laughs> at each point on your leg. Um, so they, they literally just like scan swimmers' bodies with this like big laser machine that creates a, a 3D model of their body to, to figure out, all right, exactly how tight does, does our swimsuit need to be at like each point, like going up the quad and towards the hips. Yeah, they've been, they've been so cool to work with. Just, just really great people and I mean, making awesome products. As a physics major, you get that better than most people, I guess. Yeah, I guess it's nice to uh, to understand it with with that knowledge base. And you went. Yeah. I, I read that you went to their headquarters. Was that fun? It's awesome. We always have a great time when we go out there. And that's in Germany, right? Yeah, yeah. Very small town in Germany. Um, it's where it's where Adidas and Puma are both headquartered. They're founded by brothers. Oh, that's cool. I did not know that. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, interesting so fact. Yeah. So um, a physics degree from Cal Berkeley has got to be a challenging major while you were swimming at such a high level. And t like, what attracted you to physics? Why were you going into physics? What did you hope to do with that degree? <laughs> uh, to be honest, I didn't really have that much of an idea of what I was actually getting myself into. Um, 
I think I was, I was pretty good at school in general in high school, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do in college. I mean, I was mainly going to college to swim, uh, to get better at swimming, to pursue my dream of becoming a professional athlete. So I had taken one community college intro physics course while I was in high school. And I was like, all right, yeah, physics sounds cool. I might as well major in that, um, <laughs> which, which ended up being wow. an interesting choice. But I'm really glad that I stuck with it. I mean, well, didn't, didn't anybody tell you physics is hard? <laughs> like maybe maybe you want to pick an easier one? <laughs> no, they, they did. But uh, the thing is, I'm very stubborn. So okay. Okay. I was like, no, I'm not going to I'm not going to change my major. You're wrong. Okay. But it was it was so cool to study at Berkeley. I mean, to be able to learn from from Nobel laureate professors, um, from guys who are just publishing this groundbreaking research was was awesome. I'm, I'm glad that I stuck with it like I did. That's great. Yeah, that is that is really cool. So let's start like what you're up to today, like with the, the quarantine and the, you know, lack of pool space. Tell us a little bit how you're quarantine went and i know since you're train, training partners with some people we've recently interviewed we know you're back in the water but give us a little update yeah quarantine's been good for the most part i mean fortunately the bay area is doing a pretty good job uh controlling covid so very fortunate to live here but yeah i've been trying to get outside in a safe manner as much as possible been running working out on my bike going for some good hikes when when pool space was a little more limited than it was now, I was doing some swims in the bay, but that water is very cold. So we're fortunate that we have a couple different options for pool space now. We're still not back in the water at the actual university, but hopefully that is coming soon. And we have a pretty good um, lifting weight setup at home. So for for training purposes, we we're taken care of. We're blessed to have you know, probably one of the, the best situations you could find in the world right now. So thankful to have what we have. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So t tell us just a, a little bit about swimming in the bay. Like what's the water temperature? <laughs> Where did you go? How far did you swim? I just, I'd love to hear the, paint the picture of that. Cause that's crazy. Aquatic park in San Francisco is the most popular spot. It's like a little protected cove. So you don't have to deal with all the big waves and water temp is honestly, you know, I mean, I swim in heated pools year round, so I'm used to being very comfortable, but it's been low 60s recently, Ugh. which is honestly not bad for the bay. <laughs> yeah. Only yeah. a physics major could say that. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds very cold to me. Did you just swim out 500 and back 500 or back and forth in 25 meter bursts or how did you do some training in the bay? There are these buoys set up in a straight line, which I think, you know, I, could, I could probably look this up, but they, they look like they're about 50 meters apart and there are four of them. So, so all the way down is 200. And people are usually just swimming in a circle around those, um, like using the buoys in place of a black line, basically. So you've got that, or you can go, you can just swim straight out towards, towards the bay, um, like where the, where the big boats are. And I think that's probably a bit longer, maybe, maybe 600. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So how, how many times did you swim in the bay before you got to get back into a regular pool? Quite a few times. I wasn't going like every day. It was just like, oh, I need, I need to work out. Like might as well just get in the water. I mean, it's obviously not going to be the same as, uh, you know, going 200 pace in, in a nice pool with no current in it, but, uh, you know, water's water. So it's, it's better than nothing. I noticed that you have a lot of interest in, I mean, you rock climb and, you know, obviously you're cycling and hiking and, and running. Was that, was that kind of a nice change to have all the time to keep your aerobic fitness up doing other things or was it frustrating? I mean, I, I like all those activities you mentioned, but not being able to like work out and specifically get better at the, the one thing that it is my job to be good at was very frustrating. That being said, I'm, I'm very fortunate to, to live in an, an area where, you know, there's no shortage of, of different cross training that I was able to do uh, during that time. So, yeah, I mean, been on my bike a bunch, hiking, going up and down the hills. So it, it's, so, a, it's a good situation overall. What's it like achieving your dream? I've, I've, you know, we've heard you talk about it, you know, becoming a professional athlete. Awesome. I mean, it's, it's great. I, I'm very fortunate to be able to do, you know, what I've always wanted to do for a living. It's, it's super cool. That being said, I, um, you know, once you, once you achieve a big goal, I'm sure you've talked to people who've said this before, you got to 
you got to reset it and go higher. So, you know, that's, that's what I dealt with shortly after graduating college and like, all right, well, I did it. Now I need, I need something else to go chase and go do. T- tell us about that time. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was an interesting transition to make. I'm, I'm fortunate that I've had people um, like Tom, Nathan, Natalie, who, who had gone through that process years before me to, to kind of guide me through it as well as coach Dave Durden. But yeah, it was, it was a whirlwind, honestly. I mean, the, the couple months between my last NC two A's as a college athlete um, on then Olympic trials, Olympics, trying to find a sponsor and fit that in was pretty hectic, but I was just enjoying the hell out of it. I mean, that was, <laughs> that was an awesome ride. Now, for the last couple of years, things have settled down. You know, I'm in the rhythm of, you know, what, is, what does it mean to be a professional swimmer? How do I do this? Uh, what's the day-to-day like? So, yeah, I'm definitely into more of a rhythm where my, my new goals now are clear and I can, I can pursue those confidently. The Olympic postponement, one of the things that we, you know, we have, we have sw- swimming listeners and non-swimming listeners, but we like to kind of get the... 20, 30,000 foot view of handling disappointment, handling traumatic things, how, you know, these champions like you deal with obstacles. So obviously you're, I I don't know a swimmer that isn't, wasn't disappointed by the abrupt end of the swimming season. And I know you, you know, probably had some pro swim series on your calendar and certainly the Olympic trials, uh, which would have concluded last week. Mm -hmm. How, how did you handle the Olympic postponement? Give us some thoughts that went through your, your Olympian brain. All of us on, on the Cal pro team were really disappointed when it happened. I mean, we were, we were pretty down, which obviously in hindsight seems very foolish. (laughs) This was obviously the right call. Um, I mean, can you imagine, like, if the Olympics started in three weeks, like, what, what a disaster. Even, even if, um, you know, there weren't massive boycotts from, from countries just not sending athletes, I mean, it would have been such a, a tainted game. Um, you know, so many people haven't been able to train for, for the several months just leading up to it. So, yeah, obviously the right call to postpone. But like I said, we were, we were feeling pretty down about it. You know, it's, it's only a once every four years thing. So, so you work for so long, it's, it makes it harder to, to deal with unexpected road bumps when, when it's only once every four years. So we, we took a little bit of time just away from training, away from the pool, obviously, because they were all closed. I'd say for about a week, maybe week and a half for me of just kind of decompressing off that. Um, and then we got back to it. We, we hit it pretty hard. Um, I was, I was running up and down the hills a bunch, biking a ton, doing a ton of push ups just, just in my bedroom. Cause we were, I mean, we were obviously in a really, really good spot with training. I mean, we were, it, it, it's the Olympic year. Like we were firing on all, all cylinders. So we didn't want to necessarily reset off of that. You know, like I said, we only took about a week, week and a half where we weren't really training super hard. So that's not going to have a huge detraining effect. So we didn't want to reset and start over. We wanted to carry that momentum into what is now a, a 15 or 16 month long season, which, which should be viewed as an opportunity. Normally in swimming, your season is 12 months long. If you look at it as like, you only care about the one long course competition in the summer, or you've got like a four month short course season plus an eight month long course season, something like that. So if there's a, there's now a 16 month season, there's a lot you can do with that. There's a lot of progress you can make. There's a different season plan you can approach. So, I mean, this, this has to be looked at as an opportunity if, if you want to be successful next summer. Do you feel that? I mean, you can say that. Are you, are you starting to believe it that this is just an incredible opportunity for you and your teammates? I mean, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, you look at you look at what we've been able to do with with shorter seasons, um, especially when we were back in college. You know, having to get ready for a major championship meet in March with NC Two A's, and then just a few months later in June, be ready for an even more major championship meet with Olympic trials. 
yeah, you know, I'm, I'm pumped about the, the progress that I think we can make as a group uh, with 16 months of, of working together towards this. That's great. It's a great reframe, you know, to think, okay, this is even better. I have more than 12 months. That's great. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, it does allow you to relax a little bit because, you know, as, as mentally confident as you can be, you know, you're, you're getting pretty tense as the months, as, as the clock winds down towards the Olympic trials starting. So it is a little bit more relaxed now. Like, okay, okay. I have time. So just in, in, your mindset, you said you, you decompressed for a week or week and a half. Was there a way that you, uh, tools that you used to handle it? I mean, did you guys sit around in a, in a kind of support group and, and on on zoom, of course, (laughs) and talk, uh, you know, with one another, or did you meditate or, or, uh, you know, how did you kind of, what advice would you give to people and not, you know, not like the X's and O's of swimming, but just in general, when life throws something this big and kind of tough to deal with, what what do you go to for your tools to deal with such stuff? Yeah, we, we definitely talk to each other a lot, just, you know, talk through our mindset on it. I mean, even before the, the Olympics were postponed and the pools were shut down, I mean, we were already just, um, you know, discussing the the news of the day with each other for probably like half an hour after practice every day because if you remember back like the first um the first couple weeks in march that was so chaotic like different stuff was happening every day i mean the the nba got canceled like california was getting shut down or not shut down new york was still going um there's just like so much different information being thrown at us so um yeah that that talking definitely continued after after this book, the Olympic postponement happened. And I'd say, I'd say a very general strategy I use, I guess, is just, just thinking about swimming less. There's only, there's only so much energy and intent and thought that you can throw into swimming. Like you can't, if you live and breathe and move swimming 24 seven, you'll, you'll go crazy. And, And, you know, obviously you got lots of different listeners substitute swimming for whatever your thing is, you know? So when we're, when we're at the pool, we want to, we want to be thinking about swimming only, right. You want to be focused on the task at hand, but um, if you're at home, like you want to, you want to be letting that go. There's, there's definitely a healthy balance to be had there. So with the postponement and with the, the move away from training for a short period of time, that balance shifted much, much more towards, all right, I'm just going to let this go, not, not consider this, not stress myself out about it for the next 10 days or so before we start to get back into the mode of, all right, let's, let's be an athlete again. That's, that's really good. I'd like to know, you know, I know you've had some obstacles and disappointments in your, in your career, I'm sure in your life as well. Can you, can you share, you know, some one or your, biggest obstacle or disappointment you know i'm not sure i i have like a fantastic story with with overcoming this this huge adversity and i I feel like i've honestly had a pretty normal path the the one obstacle i will say that that felt really big at the time was uh the the fall of 2015 i had a really challenging physics course load um i was gearing up for all the requirements i needed for graduation uh, and also gearing up for for the Olympic trials, obviously that was the the fall of the Olympic year. Um, and there's this really really time consuming lab course which is only available during practice times. So the year of the Olympics, I had to I had to miss a ton of swim practice so I could actually graduate college and make up all these workouts just on my own at at these weird times during like lap swim, literally. So. That was difficult enough, but also the the professor of said lab course was not very friendly towards athletes, and he said to me that I would not graduate if I remained on the swim team. <laughs> this was, I mean, obviously that that's just like an offhand comment by one guy, but I mean that that definitely motivated me to you know do everything I could, handle my time correctly, manage all the commitments that I had. And, and really get it done. I was very fortunate to have the support 
of um, my my lab partner who I worked with in that lab class was another athlete. So so he totally got it with with all the time constraints that we deal with, and we we worked really hard in every aspect to to get all that work done. So yeah, just having to use the support system that I had around me, use all the resources available to me, and and really manage my time. And I think the way I did this was just by never multitasking at all, just just only considering the the task at hand, doing that really well for like an hour to two hours, and then moving on to the next thing. Because there were a lot of things every day. That is great advice. <laughs> that is great because you had so much to do, and all you could yeah, to do was it's very the next simple. Thing. But I think I think that that really is like the the mindset advice that I've gotten that's helped me the most. Did you, did your professor ever come back and say, Hey, I was wrong? <laughs> no, I haven't talked to that guy in a while. <laughs> <laughs> did you, yeah, that is. That he was is just like great. sort of an abrasive guy in general. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, he's, he's a kind of hyperbolic dude anyway, but no, I'm, I'm not like holding a grudge or anything. Well, you actually used his words to motivate you. It sounds like, is that right? Sure. Yeah. 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 So that, you can, that's... you can write him a note and thank him. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for I saying gonna, I can't do this. <laughs> I was going to ask you if um, you said at the top of the show that you, you, you're very stubborn. This ties great into the next question. So when he said that to you, I don't know if it was stubbornness or what traits would you say, besides stubbornness or maybe just being challenged, um, have made you successful, Josh? Like what what is the Josh Pernod secret sauce that you use to achieve all these great things? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess a, a healthy level of stubbornness has got to be a part of it. I'd say the, the one thing that I think has really helped me out in that regard is being internally motivated. And I've, I've been coached on this from a very young age, which I'm very thankful for. So swimming is a sport where, um, I mean, it is a team sport, but you, you pretty much control your whole outcome, right? I mean, as much, as much work and, and focus as you put into it, like you control what you get out of it. That being said, you cannot control what your opponents do, right? It's not, it's not a sport like, like if I'm on the pitcher's mound and I'm just slinging nasty curveballs, I can affect how good my opponents perform that day, Right. But I, I can't do that in swimming. Like you can't you can't go under the landline and like pull someone back, right? You can you can only affect your own performance. So I definitely want to make sure that my goals in the sport are are for me. Like I want to be hitting my potential. And you know, obviously I think that that if I do that correctly, that I've got a great shot to to win competitions, to to be the best in the world. But being being number one in the world or winning a competition is not something that's entirely within my control. So I don't want to make that the goal. I want to make the process the goal. Wow. Um, so I think that, I mean, that's that's got to be the the mindset that that I go through the sport with. I love. I really it. like that. I really like that too. So, you know, sort of an extension of that. You 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 mentioned that. You, you know, you're, you have to just set your goals in your process. And earlier you mentioned that you just try to do the next right thing or the next thing. And you try not to multitask. Does, does that mean that you have your goals are, are just, you know, the next thing too, or do you have sort of a longer goal set? Like, can you sort of, would you be able to tell somebody the, your, the planned arch of your life or do you just like, okay, I got six months, this next six months I'm doing this. I don't know about my whole life, but yeah, no, I think it's always healthy to have, to have a longer term goal and then short term goals, which are stepping stones up to that. That's, that's a very basic tenet of goal setting. And it's, it's one that I try to follow. Yeah. I guess what I'm asking is how long is your longest term goal? A couple of years at most. I mean, beyond that, I just don't think that I have the ability to, to predict that far ahead, you know, what, right. what my life or even the world is going to look like, um, so I, I don't bother trying to, but, hmm. but yeah, like maybe a year or two in advance. Hmm. That's good. Yeah. And who knows? I mean, that's just like, who would have predicted this, this month? I, I just, 
ordered a new planner and I looked, it goes through next, the end of next June. And I'm like, God, what is the end of next June going to look yeah, like? That's, so. Yeah, it's been such a weird year. Yeah, I don't want to spend a, a lot year. of time and effort like meticulously planning these things out. And then stuff happens that's that's out of my control that just messes it all up. Like I'm gonna have to create a new plan <laughs> once I get there anyway. So uh, See, I, I might you like to, wait on that. Your 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 modus operandi is to plan to plan things you you can control, and and then just then just go and do what you what you plan to do. Rather yeah, than, I mean, I think okay. I think go that's ahead. good advice in general. Yeah, Josh, do you have any any kind of more more than just your you know, these things that are unique to your character or unique to your success, do you have any habits or rituals, routines that you do on a daily basis that just kind of, you know, yeah, whatever, you make your bed every morning or you drink a smoothie every day or you, you know, like some things that are are a routine for you? Let's see, every day I'd say, I don't know, I make, I make coffee in the morning just like millions of other people do. Um, as far as, I guess we're talking about like sports habits. Um, I like to, I mean, I don't do this every day, perhaps I should, but I like to do sort of a a debrief after each workout. So I like to go into each workout with a list of one to three things that I'm going to work on for that day. And then after, after practice, I like to come home and say, all right, how do I do on this? Like, what was I feeling? Let's compare this to, you know, how well was I doing this thing on like the best performance in my career? You know, let's, let's watch video on that. Let's look at the notes that I had written from that day. Compare, how did this feel? Was I doing this properly? No. Okay. Well, let's create the, the list for the next workout based on that. I guess that, yeah, that, that would be a, a ritual that I think is, is helpful. Oh, that's a great one. That that is, and and I I read or heard you say that that breaststroke, which is of course the the stroke that you've had so much success in, is as a slower stroke, and and it sounded like it was a challenge for you that you enjoyed to figure out how you can make this, you know, very technical sort of slower of the strokes faster. Is that part of the? Um, you know, as a guy who's interested in physics and who's obviously very analytical, is that part of the fun of it for you? Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's that's the challenge. That's that's what makes swimming hard. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that ritual is not something that takes a huge amount of time. I mean, that's literally 10 to 15 minutes after workout. So that's that's something that I like to do just to to kind of help me think about the sport correctly, I think. How do you apply what you've learned as a as an incredibly successful swimmer and champion swimmer to other parts of your life? I think there's something to be said about just the process of of learning to be better at something, the process of improvement. So that's I mean, that's really what you're chasing at workout every day is improvement. That skill that you've picked up over I mean, geez, how long have I been swimming? Probably close to, to 20 years now. I mean, the, the process of just getting better at a skill, I'd say is applicable to literally every aspect of life. So I think just the, the way you look at feedback, I guess, like wanting, it, it's very counterintuitive, right? Like if you're, if you're going to get better at something, you need to know what you're doing wrong so you can fix it. But typically as humans, we don't want to hear that, right? Like you want to hear that you're doing a good job at something. So it's it's counterintuitive, but if you do it for long enough, you you want to seek out the info on on what you're doing wrong. Like that's that's what you start to crave instead of, hey, you did a great job on this. Oh, that is that that's a jewel. Oh, I love that piece of advice. And can you apply that to things like your relationships, cooking, um, you know, how you drive a car? Can you apply that to everything? <laughs> I don't want to say everything. I don't think everything deserves that level of of analytics, but, but yeah, stuff that is like healthy to be analytical about. Sure. What yeah. wouldn't be, what wouldn't be healthy to be analytical about? Uh, I mean, you, you mentioned relationships. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not that. Yeah. My husband loves physics too. This is, I'm, that's why I'm loving talking to you. And uh, he's very analytical about our relationship. So 
I was just, I was just wondering if, you know, I don't know if it has anything to do with physics, but, you know, I was just wondering if, you know, his mind works like your mind and, you know, he, he, he likes to step back and say, okay, you know, what went well, you know, what went wrong. He can be very, um, you know, just very, I guess, analytical. I don't want to say cold, but, you know, he doesn't get as emotional as I do. Um, right. I, yeah. No, yeah. I think, I think that's me too, sometimes to my detriment. So I try to, I try to turn that mode off. When it needs to be off. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but it's probably really helpful in swimming. Yeah, I mean, in racing, you know, you're behind the blocks and, um, you know, you probably don't, oh, too much emotion can, can be kind of bad. So let's, um, let's put you in the Olympic final in 2016 and talk about your mindset. Um, you know, you're, you're out there, you could win the gold, you could win the you know, the, the no finish, uh, but you, you end up with the silver, which is, is awesome. Um, when you step out on that stage, which was more pressure for you that or the Olympic trials? Cause some people say the U S Olympic trials are more pressure filled than the actual Olympics themselves, but give us a little peek into your mindset of, of those types of high pressure swims. So walking out on deck for the Olympic final, I'm chilling. I am literally just vibing, <laughs> enjoying the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, this was a case of me not really resetting my goals. And I think it was actually beneficial. So, uh, you know, kids don't do this, you should reset your goals. <laughs> but um, this helped me to just swim with zero pressure. Because after after Olympic trials, the the experience of going, I mean, we were home for like, maybe four or five days, and then we went straight to Olympic training camp. I mentioned the games that month was just a whirlwind Um, because my ultimate goal in sports up until that point was just be an Olympian. And then at trials, I did it. So I was like, cool, this is awesome. Now I did, I get to just enjoy this. And I I really didn't go into it with, um, you know, a solid goal of like, Oh, I'm going to go out there and win a gold medal. Um, Cause like I said, that's, that's an outcome goal. It's not a process goal. So I, I was like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to do the best I can, but this is, such an incredible experience. I'm going to enjoy the absolute hell out of this. And, and I definitely did. I've said this in interviews before, but when I walked out on deck for, for the final in Rio, I was in a, a early ish lane to get announced. So I had the opportunity to step out there just take a few breaths, calm myself down, look around the arena, appreciate the moment. And then while everyone else was getting announced, then do my, my warm up process, get ready and step up on the blocks. My experience at Olympic trials was the exact opposite of that. I, that was the most nervous I have ever felt for, for a competition. And that, that level of nervousness did not subside for, for the entire week from, from my arrival in Omaha before the meet started to, uh, to me touching the wall at the end of that 200 breaststroke final. Just horrible. I mean, it's such high stakes, right? Like you, you win you get a spot on the Olympic team, you don't, you have to wait, I guess now it's five years instead of four, you have to wait five years for your next shot at that. Like that's, that's horrible to try to think about and deal with. And like, you got to put that away somehow before the biggest race of your life. Like that's so hard. Fortunately, I was, I was so honed in to the process again, uh, big process guy here, the process of swimming a 200 meter breaststroke. I'd done it so many times that season i knew that i had the ability to to swim the race multiple different ways and be successful that i was able to just focus enough on that put the nerves aside just enough to to perform at my best and that was a really good outcome for me wow that just mesmerized me i just i it was palpable your nervousness at trials and i i you know it's the it's the any athlete or anybody who gives speeches or does anything that's scary, even going to your local 5K road race, you know, you pull into the parking lot and the butterflies just start flying in your stomach. And I can imagine you having that for the entire time of being at the trials until you you made the team. But I I want to dig a little deeper on your thoughts on, so at trials, you are totally outcome oriented because you got to get top two or you're not going to make your goal of being an Olympian. And then at the actual Olympics, you're just like soaking it in. You're, you're enjoying the process. You're not really thinking, Hey, I've got to get on the podium. 
So how do you reconcile that now as the best approach to a top performance? I, I wouldn't say that I was completely outcome oriented at trials. I, I would still say that that was, that was process focused. Obviously the outcome goals and even at the Olympics too, like that's in, that's in your mind, obviously, like that's, that's a very tangible thing. You're literally looking when you're standing on the starting blocks, you're looking at the opposite end of the pool. That's where the podium is. Um, <laughs> like you, yeah. you know, that's there, but that mm-hmm. doesn't, that doesn't change how you approach like the actual, the actual four laps of the race, like the process of doing it. Um, that doesn't mean that you're thinking the whole time, okay, I got to win, got to win or get second. Like, um, no, I'm thinking about the process of it and how to do it. Like I was using the information from my prelim swim and my semifinal swim. I was like, all right, 208, 41 in semifinals. I need to be at least half a second faster or I've, I've got no shot at this. Those, that half a second has got to come from the last 75 of the race. Like I, I knew exactly how I wanted to approach it. At, at trials in the final, that's the most perfectly I've ever done it. I'm like, all right, this is how I'm going to go through the race. Like this, this is where I'm going to um, like conserve energy. This is where I'm going to put energy and speed into it. Uh, this, is, this is what I want to happen with, with you know, this outcome being my time. Trials is the most accurately I've ever done that in my life. So I not to push back too hard, but I would say that was still a process oriented uh, mindset in that race. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great great clarification. Yeah. Uh, That, that clarifies it for me because I, I'm just assuming you're outcome oriented because it's trials, but so it's process, 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 which is, is an awesome take home. Yeah. And I guess that's like, it's not to say that you're not thinking about outcome or you, you're not desiring the outcome because obviously you are. Um, I think the point is that you're never going to be able to sh- like shake outcome from, from your mind entirely. So by focusing on process, you're going to have at least a, a healthy balance of the two. How, how yeah. granular is the process? You're, you, you know, you've described just being so, so nervous. And then, you know, you step up. This is Olympic trials we're talking about. You, you step up on the block and then you go into process. And you know, you know, what you have to do, you describe the times you need and the effort, but is it down to the, like each stroke, like are each stroke, are you thinking about as you're going, moving along? You know, what's, what is exactly going through your mind? Uh, I'm going to give a very general answer here. I'm sorry. It totally depends on how dialed in you are and, and just, just what you're feeling leading up. I mean, there's, there's so many things that you got to think about in swimming, um, just, just biomechanically technique wise. So it totally depends on you know what's what's automatic for you i guess like what's automatic and what do you have to think about to make it go right because that those things just shift so much yeah yeah and then you know like you said you knew from semis to finals you needed to drop a half second in your last and you want to do that in the last 75 so that's pretty pretty detailed there well Gosh, what great answers. Um, yeah. I don't want us to run over our, right. our limit of time here, but I, I want to ask um, before the very last question, what advice would you give to a young swimmer out there that wants to be an Olympian? What, what would you just a general piece of advice? This is very general, and I'm sure they've probably heard this before, but working hard is, is like the baseline. Basically, everyone, everyone who wants to be good is going to work hard. But there's a difference between, I guess, trying hard and working hard. So, so trying hard is just effort. Like you, you go to practice, you're getting your heart rate up, you're like exerting your muscles, you're trying hard. Working hard involves a lot more than that. That's, that's, um, that's improving technique. That's thinking about what you can do outside of practice time to make yourself better. That's nutrition. It's hydration. It's so many other things than just uh, showing up to the workout, the thing that everyone does, and exerting your muscles, the other thing that everyone does. So if you want to kind of separate yourself from the pack, um, just the act of trying hard is not going to be enough. Good answer. That well, is such you're... a good answer. Yeah, I hope I'm, you're listening like, out there, yeah. kids. <laughs> well, I'm applying this to my own life. You know, I mean, you, you, you're you right. It's the whole package is all the stuff that you do. I think other people have told us that before, but the way you said it, really just struck a chord. Very good. Thank you. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm sure that is a popular answer, <laughs> but I think we have heard it. But but yeah, but the way but the way you said it, it was like yeah, yeah. It's because I do work hard out hard in all my workouts, but sometimes I don't work smart or you know when I'm not out you know actually working you know, working out. <laughs> and so I think that's a really, yeah, 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 that's great. Well, okay. Uh, our last question for you is, um, is there something that we haven't covered that you'd like to, that you'd like to say? Anything else that you'd like to tell us? I, I don't think there is. I think we hit it. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we do have a little uh, speed round as we call it, or our sprinter round of just fun questions and uh, are you ready for just a little, little, little fun that'll help our listeners get to know you better? I'm ready. Take your bar. All right. Cat or dog? Dog. Red or blue? Uh, blue. Milk chocolate or dark chocolate? Dark. Kickboard or no kickboard? No board. Mountains or beach? Mountains. Football or baseball? Football. iPhone or Android? iPhone. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Morning person or night owl? Morning, for sure. Okay, we've modified this last one. Boxers or briefs or boxer briefs? Boxer briefs. There you go. Okay. Good, good addition. <laughs> yeah. Maria. Got okay, we got, I've got, these are little short answer uh, questions. What's your favorite color, Josh? Uh, blue. Okay, favorite pizza topping? Let's go pepperoni, the classic. <laughs> okay. Favorite vegetable? Bok choy. Bok choy. Oh, great answer. Wow. That's, that's we've that's, never that's, heard that I've one. Never going heard for that the deep one. cut. <laughs> <laughs> right. The, the favorite, your favorite swim complex that you've swum in in the U.S.? In the U.S.? Yeah. It's got to be Omaha. Something on your pre race playlist. Or do you have a pre race playlist? Yeah. The story so far, they're a punk band from the Bay Area. Okay. What's, what's your shoe size? 10. Uh, siblings? Do you have any siblings? I do not. Okay. What's your favorite Star Wars character? Uh, Yoda. Yay! Yoda! Yoda! <laughs> I've been waiting for someone to say Yoda. Has no I've one been... said that? No I've one. Been... Uh, really? I feel like no. somebody said Yoda. No, no. You're the first one, Josh. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's unbelievable. But it's you're unbelievable. Welcome. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I, I, had to, I had to get excited. Um, can you cook? Yes. Okay. What's your What's your favorite thing to cook, or what's What's something you cooked lately? Um, I've been cooking a lot of Italian lately. Oh, cool. Mm. What stuff. word? This is the last one. What word comes to mind most when you dive in the water? <laughs> uh, to be honest, I'm not really thinking about words at that point. Is there a feeling or a color or an you know, emotion? Just an emotion. I'm just, I'm just thinking about swimming in general. Okay. All right. Okay. Very well, good. Yeah. Awesome. Josh, this was such a pleasure. You really, had such really. Great answers. Loved it. I loved yeah. it. Really, yeah, really. Thank you guys. It. This is fun to talk about. Yeah. Good. We're. We're going to be wishing you all the best and uh, cheering for you and just, uh, you know, really, really thank you for being on the show. Thanks so much, Josh. All right. Take care. All right. You too. Bye-bye. Takeaways, takeaways, takeaways. We've heard from you that your favorite section of our podcast is the takeaways. Thank you so much for that feedback. But before we get to the takeaways today... We wanted to ask you if you would please give us a five-star review. That way, more people will be able to find our podcast. Also, if you could subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher or Spotify, you'll never miss a podcast episode if you subscribe. And please share our podcast with your friends. And now, the takeaways. So, Maria, what a fantastic interview. I, I just, there was so much there. Yeah, I, I, we were just chatting between the interview and this, this uh, recording. And I, you know, he, I love talking to him because he, as I mentioned during the show, he reminded me of my husband, the, the analytical side, but also just sort of the kindness in it. You know, it's not, some people are very analytical are not, you know, as warm and, and sweet. <laughs> anyway, yes, he, yeah, re and let, he reminded and, me of Jim. Let me, yeah. And let me brag on your husband a little bit because it's easier for me to do not all you know when we say we're comparing josh to your husband who is a medical doctor 
you know, incredibly successful medical doctor and businessman and loving father and grandfather and brother. And he is, you know, this is my little brother (laughs) and he's just, he is so smart and has done so much. How many patents does Jim have at the patent office? Yeah, he's got, he's got several, but, but that's what, yeah, that's what was really fun about talking to Josh. It's just that, yeah, yeah, and that, he, he, that Josh is very sweet. Yeah, so yeah. I just, it, you know, if Josh is listening, it's a great thing to be compared with, <laughs> with your husband. It so, is. Um, he's, yeah, the, he's, has, he's, he's the man that one of us loves most in the world and the other one at least second most in the world. Oh, definitely. Definitely. <laughs> he is he is an Olympic gold medalist in his own field. Yeah, that's so. right. That's right. Anyway, so my, there were, like I said, there was so much takeaway. Uh, my first one and you and I discuss, hey, this this just was kind of the overarching theme. If you get nothing else out of this show, Josh uses the process. And we hear that all the time. You know, it's the journey, not the destination. Focus on the process, not the outcome. But really his stories of the process in the pressure-packed Olympic trials and focusing on, you know, good stroke count and good pullouts and the last 75 of the race he had to drop you know a half second that's process Mm -hmm. and you know just that is it it really is life in fact Mm -hmm. another way to say process is stay in the moment Mm -hmm. because when you're staying in the moment you're you're thinking about that stroke Mm -hmm. and not when your hand hits the wall are you in first second or eighth you know, so I just I loved his focus on the process, and that is that is a huge takeaway, and one that I don't think, you know, I can ever be reminded enough of. Totally agree, and you know, he he made the point again and again that you can't control outcome, but you can control at least you can control process more than you can control outcome. So he could, you know, he could control every little part of his practice and how he lives his life and all the things he does. And he could, you know, can think about what he's doing in the race. And then if he comes out first, second or third, you know, that's the outcome. But so the great thing about process is that you have a lot more ability to control it than you can, you know, what happens in your life. Yes. Yes. So what was your first takeaway, Maria? Oh, I loved, um, you know, his, well, first he said, you know, during that difficult period when he was um, taking the the chemist, the uh, physics lab, and they had the the professor who said, you know, you're not gonna, you're not, you can't do this, you know, and 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 he talked about how hard it was, and the way he did it was by not trying to do it all, not looking ahead, not multitasking, but just doing the thing that he needed to do in that hour or, or hour and a half, and concentrating fully on that. And I think that's an extension of process. It's like you're not worrying about the end; you're just doing the right thing right now. Um, and that's for me. That's just a great reminder. Anybody who struggles with you know anxiety and overwhelm, you know, we can't control you know, the big thing. And if you look ahead, you're just going to, you know, you're just going to get overwhelmed, but you can control what you're doing in this moment. And, you know, and there's a lot of peace in that. So I thought that was a beautiful uh, takeaway. Yes. In fact, I just saw a great or read or heard, I don't know which medium of media it came to me on, but it was a, a scientific study on multitasking and how terrible it is for us. Mm -hmm. Not, not just, um, is it less productive when we multitask, but it's also bad for our brain and stress. And uh, so that is just a, you know, a really great one to, to not multitask. It used to be, oh, kind of cool. Like, like I could, you know, do my laundry, fold my laundry while I'm checking emails and while I'm listening to an audio book. And, you know, it's mm-hmm. like, um, so I love that one. Love, love, love the, the no multitasking and focusing on the present. So, um, the the second one that I had was when he said that he felt like one of his keys to success for him was that he was internally motivated. And that was huge that, you know, he he worked on controlling only what he could control. And, you know, there's kind of a theme here. Some of this ties in when you're in the process, you're just focusing on what you're doing. Um, and I, I thought it was so cute when he said, we can't go under the lane rope and grab the other swimmer and pull him backwards. So 
you know, you can only, this one for me falls under staying in your lane, being focused on what you can do. And also there's internal motivation versus external motivation. So, you know, are you doing something because your spouse wants you to, or your coach wants you to, or your, you know, uh, the culture thinks it's cool, but if you're doing it for someone else, then that is not the best way to success. Then if you are really just, just highly motivated because you enjoy what you're doing and you feel in flow with it and it's um, something that, you know, has value to you, then that's, I think that's a, a big part of being internally motivated. And it sounds like that's what Josh does. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think some people are, are just better at that intrinsically, but um, you know, but I, I, I completely agree with that. It's so it's, it's nice to know who you are. He sounds like he's a guy who knows who he is. And I yeah. love, I love that. Okay. Well, my last um, takeaway, there was so much, as we said, but the one that I want to highlight is I loved the technique of debriefing after each practice. And, you know, I kind of asked him, you know, more about that. Is, is that, you know, applicable to, you know, all your parts of life? Because, you know, the answer I was looking for is yes, <laughs> but, but I, you know, he's right, probably not as, as good in some things as others. But I loved, it, it wasn't just that, you know, he, he did, you know, he had goals going into practice. He said he, he did his practice and then he would look back. Okay. You know, how did I do, you know, he, and he look at, at train, you know, at tapes and, and, and wasn't afraid. And this is the key here wasn't afraid to see that he'd done something wrong, wasn't afraid to look for areas of improvement. This is a real weakness for me. I, I don't, you know, once I do something, I just, I don't ever want to look back. But looking back, you know, and finding areas where you can improve is just, it's a beautiful, beautiful habit to bring into your life. And not not using, you know, negativity or shame, but like, oh, you know, I, I did that and I could have done that better. You know, and I think for a while there, I was doing this on Fridays. I was looking back at my week and, you know, thinking, okay, you know, what, what did I do? Which is always good to say, hey, you did this and this was great. But then to look back and say, what could I have done better? I think that's just, it's, it's a beautiful thing that champ, that true champions do. Because you're only going to get better if you're not afraid to look at where you haven't been perfect or haven't been exactly what you wanted to be. Yes. Yeah, so, and this is something we can use in you know, anyone can use, you don't yeah. have to do it after swim practice. No. You can do it after right. anything, after your whole day, after right. whatever. So right. I love it. Yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. Great, great stuff. Great stuff. Another one, another great champion yeah. we're learning from. And yes. uh, it's just so fun, Maria. So thank you so much. I love you. Thank you, and, Kelly. Uh, I love you up. too. Great. See great you afternoon. on the next show. Okay. Bye-bye. All righty. This week's quote of the week comes to us from Josh Perneau. My best time management is done by never multitasking, only considering the task at hand and doing that really well and then moving on to the next thing. You've been listening to the Champions Mojo podcast with host Kelly Palace and Maria Parker. Champions Mojo is produced by Cobra Media and a new episode debuts every Tuesday. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and leave us a five-star review. Follow Champions Mojo on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Champions Mojo.